we can't work just to earn money. Of course, that's why we work, but if we can add excitement and a bit of, 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 of joy to work, well, that's so much the better. Welcome to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries podcast, where we meet some of the most fascinating folk involved in the development and implementation of valves, actuators and other engineering solutions. In this episode, we meet Dr. Martin Frank of Schuff, and in a forthright and candid conversation with VPS's Steve Pearson, Martin talks us through the history of the business, which was originally founded in 1911, key developments in its early years through the 20s, 30s and 1940s. We learn about a particular and formative fork in the road. We hear also about expansion from Germany into Western and Eastern Europe, Korea, Taiwan, the USA, Ireland and India, the acquisition of Fetterhoff and Martin's thoughts and ambitions for the long-term future of Schuff and what he loves doing when he's not working. Enjoy this episode. Right. Hello, Martin. Thanks for joining us on the podcast this morning. I wonder whether you could just uh, give the listeners a brief introduction to yourself, um, your background, and we'll uh, we'll start the story from there. Uh, good morning, Steve. Thank you for having me on the on the podcast. Um, yeah, my name is Martin Frank. I've been working in this industry since 1984. Um, to myself, to my own background, I grew up mostly in Ireland. I'm I'm German. Uh, but my parents moved to Ireland when I was nine years old. So I spent 20 years in Ireland from the age of nine till about the age of 28, 29. Um, did all my, my schooling, my university, etc. there and came back really to take over Schuf in 1984. And um, since then, I've been working for Schuf. It was my first job. And... Um, I kind of got pushed into it at the time because my, my father wasn't that well and it was a sort of a do it now or, or, or stay away. So I did and I had no idea of how to run a company at the time. I had just finished my PhD, enjoyed student life and um, I was picked up by our finance manager at the airport and um, he brought me into Schuff and he sat me down behind a big desk and left me to it. <laughs> okay. So the first year was a little complicated. We made our first loss in our history. But thankfully, we, we um, with the help of many others in Shuf, uh, who taught me the ropes, things got better after that. So you were responsible for the first loss? Indeed, yes. Well, that, that, that's maybe not quite true because the company was founded in 1911. And the earliest accounts I could find was 1960. Wow. So I was responsible for the first law since 1960. I would have to presume that some of the war years and things like that, either the First or Second World War, there surely must have been some laws since then. But um, I, it, it was the first law that I could trace. Yeah, yeah. So, so you mentioned there the company was founded in 1911. Um, could you just sort of give us a, a little bit of an insight into sort of what you know from those days and, you know, how the company was formed and, and sort of how Schuff, Schuff became, really. Okay. Well, Schuff was founded not as Schuff, but as Schwertzel und Frank. So my surname is Frank, right? So there's a hint. It was my grandfather and my granduncle, and whose name was Schwertzel. So the two of them decided to get together. One was an expert in valves. One was an expert in apparatus. And... Um, their jobs had been to be industrial engineers for companies like Böhringer, Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals, and things like that, on a freelance basis. In those days, those companies were much smaller, and they didn't have as much permanent staff as they obviously would now. So the two of them, being brother-in-law, got together and thought, well, why don't we start a company and make something out of this? And... Um, the first production was started sometime in the late 1910s uh, or the early 1910s. My, my grandfather invented uh, the bottom outlet valve and the lift plug valve. And um, that was really what they started to produce. But the, the, the name of the first company, Schwertzen und Frank, became Schuf Amateur und Apparatebau. Apparatebau is German for, you know, apparatus. Yeah. So, 
we did build, we did make not only valves, we made apparatus until the late 1980s. And at that stage, we had to make a decision in, because, you know, it's, it's a difference whether you make apparatus, which involves welding large plates and things like that together, yeah. or if you make valves, which is more of a turning operation. So we decided we would invest and we would stick to valves and they, you know, um, invest in a modern machine park for that. And we gave up on the apparatus in the late 80s. So that's kind of a fork in the road for the company at that time then? Yes. But, so, but initially in the 1911, um, you know, we were prepared to make anything that people would pay us to make. And um, um, the company did most of their production outsourcing, even in those days, until the 1920s when they built a factory in a place called Frankfurt Dintling, which is the westernmost district of Frankfurt, beside Höchst. Uh, Höchst used to be, it's now broken up, and it used to be not only uh, one of the three biggest chemical companies in the world, Höchst, I think, named after the, the township of Höchst, which is the second most western part of Frankfurt. And sure, and, um, right on the doorstep there then. Well, that's uh, the reason my my, my grandparents and um, grand uncle they were from from Zintlingen from this this part. So that was one motivation, and the second was that they did a lot of work for Hoogst. Uh, so it was in those days, you know, business was done a little differently. My grandfather would come home every day for a, a snooze in the afternoon. He would <laughs> on, his, on his bicycle. The foundry was within wheelbarrow distance of the of Schuf, and the uh, the apprentice would would take the wheelbarrow and get the far the the, the castings. You know, so um, things were maybe a little bit slower and a little bit simpler. Yeah, very much so. And then, sort of the the business obviously progressed. Then, sort. Of- of through sort of the 1920s and, you know, the bits I've read upon sort of development of sort of the disc valves and the piston bottom outlet valves and, and things like that. Do you, you know, do you have much sort of um, history on that type of thing? Um, well, we had, we made this valve first with the lift plug valves. They were in the 10s. In the 1920s, then my grandfather invented the, the piston bottom outlet valve. In those days, things like slurries came up and, um, um, some higher viscosities, and we needed a full free flow rather than having the spindle remain in the flow. The piston valve, of course, withdraws fully, so that was its advantage. That's what we built in the 1920s. And there was initial work on what we now know as co liquefaction, heavy oil upgrading. Work was done on that, and um, they began developing some valves for that. But it was very much early stage stuff. It was only in the 1930s that really took off. So there's quite a lot of development and sort of hands-on sort of working with the customers and, and trying to solve problems for them, I presume, in those days, sort of on, on one-off applications and, and making the valves to suit the application rather than sort of having a warehouse full of things as, as companies have today. Exactly. I mean, Schuff has never been a big stocking company, and we've always, even in those days, more specialized on problem-solving, making one-off, especially for somebody's... Um, to solve somebody's problem and then hoping of course to find that same problem in other places and solving it with the same solution so so that's carried on sort of through the you know the 20s the 30s the 40s the 50s um you know were there there any other major developments throughout that time before you sort of came in 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 sort of 1984 well i mean there was obviously the the 1930s saw the development of this co-liquefaction stuff with uh, with vows for that the 1940s were a tough time, obviously, because of the war. Mm-hmm. And um, there was no one left. I think there were most people who were drafted to fight and um, or to build plants. Yeah. And only in the 1950s, things began to recover. And um, we were very lucky in that our plant had been slated for reparation shipment to Russia after the Second World War. But very luckily, my grandfather had actually helped save some people who'd, who then got away to Florida. And they wrote a letter to the American command. And because of that, our company was saved from having to give away its machinery. 
Oh wow! Okay. Well, that was a big, a big bonus, right? We didn't. We yeah. probably we may not have survived because after the war there wasn't really any money for buying new machines. Yeah. So by having so the we had, day. although the machinery was not in great condition, at least it was something to work with until things got going again, and and then you could buy new machinery. Yeah. And um, in the fifties, obviously, most of the market was in Germany. The chemical industry had survived quite well and was doing well. And then my father really started exporting. He and his exporting, you know, just shows you the difference in aspirations at that time. He would go down to Basel, which is on the border, a Swiss, is a Swiss town on the border with three big pharmaceutical companies. He would go down every week for a day, and he would become the standard supplier of valves for the Basel chemical industry. And they developed a Basel norm, it was called in the 50s. Um, the first attempt to standardize bottom outlet valves. And he then set his eyes on Holland and after that on the UK. So he started exporting to the UK in the 90, early 60s. And and was, was that then sort of how the factory in Ireland came about? No, no, that, that, was, that was only 1990. Um, what happened then in 1970s, my brother Wolfgang, who was a bit older than me, started our subsidiary in England, Shoof UK, and, um, which, is, which was a sales company. It has uh, since transformed to an actuator manufacturing company. Yeah. But it was a sales company in the 70s and it was very successful and um, claimed a very high market share. And the British chemical industry, ICI at its forefront, was very successful and, and, and very strong. And did some of the first PVC plants and things like that, which we supplied valves to in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the PTA, um, first uh, big PTA companies were up in Wilton by ICI. We supplied valves to those. So, um, so basically, Shuf UK was our first um, subsidiary outside of Germany. And um, my brother then decided that when I took over the company in Germany in 1984, he decided that, uh, that he needed a change as well. And um, he sold Shuf UK to a friend of his, and we set up Shuf USA. Uh, so he, in 1984, he moved to the uh, United States. Initially, that was hard because, um, to, get, to get a grip on a very, very big market in a one-man show. Yeah. But... Yeah, things began coming together in the in the late eighties. I was beginning to get a grip on the Asian market, and he was getting a grip on the United States. And um, we had great successes in those days. Um, Korea and Taiwan were really taking off, and we had our first sort of job over a million D marker in those days. And we had three or four of them in the late eighties, and. We had severe capacity constraints in Frankfurt, where the company was, you know, in Frankfurt, Simpson. Because remember, I was telling you that the Hooks, our gay company, was right beside us, and there was yeah. no room for expansion and no people to be had for love or money because, you know, they were all offered big jobs in Hooks, our gay as well. Yeah, yeah. So in the, we decided we would go outside. And in the late 80s, you know, the, the, um, the collapse of the Iron Curtain meant we had a chance to go to, say, Hungary or somewhere like that. We had started buying castings from Spain in the late 80s as well, so another option was to go to Spain. But if you remember, I had grown up in Ireland, and I, I thought to myself, well, it's hard enough to start a new company from scratch, a manufacturing company, yeah. something we haven't done before. And, um, you know, then to have to hire people in a foreign language, Spanish or Hungarian, it's very hard to interview people and to catch nuances, etc. So I thought it might be best to, to stick to Ireland. And, the, and Ireland had the IDA, or still has, and the IDA is a really, really good organization. Um, they basically, when I expressed an interest of investing in Ireland, we made an appointment. I arrived at the airport. They picked me up. They took me around Ireland for a week and showed me plants that were ready to go. Um, and locations that they would suggest, and sub suppliers, and things like that. They really made it easy to For you set to up in, a, in that country. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, amazing. And it was very, very clever. And they gave you some subs uh, subsidies in at that time. 
based on the number of jobs you were creating. And Ireland had a high unemployment uh, at the time, it was something like 18% in some parts of the country. So, you know, they were paying unemployment benefit to these people. Once we created those jobs, they were getting income tax from them. And I worked it out, the subsidiary they gave us, the subsidy they gave us, they got back in a year from each, each job created. Wow. So it was a win-win situation for everybody. And, but for small companies like us, the money is one thing, but also the ease of doing it, because you have limited management capability. There's only the one of me, right? So if the IDA is willing to, to smooth the path to help you look, to help you set up, etc., that's worth a lot as well. Yeah, very so much that's so. the reason why we set up in Ireland. Um, we needed capacity, and we could do it easily and quickly, relatively cheaply because of the grant in Ireland. Yeah. And, and that's, so, that's, um, so we, we set up on the first... That took 1980s then, did it? No, we started on the 1st of September, I think, 1990. Okay. Right. So that was our second over investment abroad. And um, I think that was about it then until the year 2000 when we set up a company in India, Shuf India. And um, because at this stage, our suppliers in Spain, one of them had gone bankrupt, another one, it was difficult to get stuff out of them quickly enough, and some Indian foundries had approached us. And um, while some of the, qu the quality from some of them was not great, the quality from others was amazing. And we decided we would set up in India and start ordering castings there. But, you know, just in case the amazing quality was only a fluke, we thought we'd be better off machining the stuff in India, checking it, and making sure the quality is, is perfect after machining, before yeah. you ship it that long way to Europe. And so that, that started us with Shuf India as a, ca a foundry buying company, then a foundry, a casting machining company, and now a fully fledged valve manufacturer and designer. And that's amazing. So you, you're starting to spread the net, you know, further and wider. Then you've got your, you know, your thing in America. You've got obviously Ireland coming on strong. You're into India, and sort of, you know, looking back at the history, I think one of the next big things was sort of the maybe the the acquisition of Fetteroff around sort of 2004, was it? Correct. Yes, we had been talking with people from Fetteroff, Jay Williams. Um, his children were, didn't seem to be interested in joining the company. So, you know, and he was a re approaching retirement age. And while these, he had no... Were these a major competitor at this time, Martin? Sorry? Were they a major competitor of yours at this time? Oh, yes, yes. They were by far the most important competitor at that time. And, but, you know, we, we you know, you meet at, at shows and things like that, and we discuss, we're discussing the future. We shared a relatively... Um, um, similar views of our, where the companies should go and things like that. So we, it seemed to be the um, a good match. Uh, and um, we were able to reach agreement in 2004. And, um, yeah, we bought it then. Uh, no, in, in we reached agreement in 2003, and I think the deal closed and the papers were all signed and bank approvals, etc., were obtained in 2004. So that gave us a second foothold in the States. Shuf USA in, in, the, in the vicinity of Charleston, South Carolina, and Fedorov near Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. So that was quite an uh, acquisition for you then, and gave you quite a bit more market share, I would presume. Well, it gave us a lot, a, a, very good, a very much improved penetration, of course, of the American market. And also we had different strengths and weaknesses. Um, we both made bottom outlet valves. We were probably had more market share there, but they had more market share in, in, for example, the PVC industry. We had more market share in the polyester and PTA industry. We, they may have had a bit more in the nylon. You know, so we 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 had complementary products in the sense that overlap for bottom outlet valves, but um, they had or have the line blind systems, for example, while we have control valves for severe services. You know, so these two things, um, so our line grew greatly because of the acquisition. 
and our penetration of the different industry parts. So it was a good, a good, a good fit, really, for from both sides. I think from uh, you know what what we see from the product range now as well. It uh, you know it, it gives a really nice range of products that fit together quite nicely. It does indeed. Yeah. So if we if we take it from there, sort of, you've got obviously up to the present day. You know, were, were there any other sort of major developments that you can sort of shed a bit of light on for us over that time that kind of moved the company forward? Well, yeah, there was. Um, Three major things, if you look back in history, one was breaking into the PTA market in Korea initially in the control valve part of it. We had already in, in, in England supplied on-off and um, automated and manual valves and drain valves, but we hadn't supplied the control valve. And we managed to break into one with great success in Korea in the late 80s. And that, was, that established us as a major force for PTA. That was one major thing. The second, probably even more important, was I told you that in the in the in the Second World War, Germany was uh, we were building valves for the direct coal liquefaction. Yeah. That's a process where you make fuel oil out of coal. And um, obviously, Germany at the time had no access to oil in sufficient quantity um, because the Middle East was closed. So they made it out of coal instead. And the drop in the oil price after the Second World War really made those processes non-economically viable. But once the oil prices started rising again in the 2000s, China, being great strategists, decided to build a coal liquefaction plant. And uh, we managed to win that order. And um, again, that plant operates very successfully. It's a very challenging service. And uh, that has established us as the main force in coal liquefaction, also heavy oil upgrades. The two things are similar. One, you're both you're adding hydrogen, either to heavy oils, vacuum fuel, residue, and things like that, or to coal. And that was a huge development for, for sure. Another thing is it was the purchase of La Tecno Valvo in 2012 to 2015. And that's an Italian company a competitor of ours that was very strong in Italy, of course, and in process-wise in PEPP manufacturing. So it helped us there. And it also helps us with uh, our capacity because it gives us access to that big network of Italian sub-supplies in the north of Italy. Yeah. That's fast and have great quality. So those are sort of the three major things that probably happened. Recently, we've been getting into the power industry, uh, selling. Control we've had our first successes selling control valves into the power industry. I think that will, in future, although you know people uh, want to get to renewables, that doesn't still really lot, negate. There's still a lot of business there, though, isn't there? For the time being, There's still a lot of business in the power industry, you know. And um, so, I think that those are sort of our main. Our main drives into the future are these areas. We've also traditionally been very strong in the pharmaceutical industries, and we've had some major inventions there for adding PAT process um, um, uh, probes, sorry, not probes, uh, into the um, valves, which allows online measurement, not just of temperature, which we've been able to do for a long time, but things like cloudiness, viscosity, density, and those kinds of things. So this and is that, of course, a lot of money if you were trying to develop new medicines and perfect their production. Yeah, I think this is where we see in the UK, especially where they, you know, they can actually put the probes up through the actual bottom outlet valves, and they can, you know, they can get real time data of what's actually happening in the uh, in the vessel. Um, wow. rather than taking a sample, you know, going away, testing it, coming back. Sometimes the reactions moved on a little bit, um, right. and and they've you know they've missed the set point for the for the mixture or, or the reaction that's taking place. And I think from a safety point of view and a, an environment point of view, that seems to be coming online as well because you know a lot of these chemicals that are in these reactions they're, they're quite dangerous and you know hazardous to uh, to dispose of. You can't kind of just get rid of them very easily. So um, we, we see only, that as being quite Not only that, they're also very expensive. Well, that's, yes, that's the other thing. They are very expensive as well. No, so, so you're, you're actually giving a great, um, it's, it's a dream combination. You're improving safety 
and cutting cost. Yeah. And I, I right. think what's a challenge for a lot of the, the chemical and pharmaceuticals companies now is they, they can produce things in the lab and they can do things in the lab, but then sometimes they can't up scale it and replicate it in the actual plant because the vessel maybe hasn't got enough nozzles to put a, a probe in or a temperature sensor or something. So I think we've seen by being able to put it through the box on my outlet valve, it, it gives the customer a great opportunity to, you know, move the process forward from the lab actually into full production. Right. Um, and I think, that, you know, from our point of view, especially in the UK, because a lot of things we're doing is retrofit into vessels that have been in situ for a long time. It's, uh, you know, it's a great development for us. And, right. and, and leading on from that, you've started a new company. You've got uh, Frank Parametric now. Could you give us a little bit of a background on that? Yes, well... The word everywhere nowadays is Industry 4.0 and or the Internet of Things. Yeah. And um, we don't want to be left behind in that. And we've, we had a brainstorming and we thought, OK, our vision is to create a parametric, a true parametric design where, in the, you know, in the, in the end stage, the customer or even the customer's computer can talk to our computer and design his valve himself. This is the long-term future, right? Yeah. And uh, the first step to that will be to parametrically design our valves in true parametric, in a true parametric way. If you go, for example, onto a website now for a kitchen, you can design your own kitchen. Or if you go, if you want to buy a car, you can yeah. pick and choose, and you can design your car. But of course, you're not really designing your car or your kitchen, what you're doing is you're picking out pre-designed items and fitting them together. Yeah. Right? They've all been completely designed. And what we, want, our, our, what we want to do a little bit differently is that we want, to make, we want to make a general design for a particular valve and have the customer be able to enter things that may make, you know, even if he makes a mistake, so we need an intelligent learning system that identifies these mistakes and creates a drawing form. Wow. And we, exactly. I mean, like, you know, it, it's a long-term project. It's not something we're going to be rolling out an end result next, next week or next year or even in two years. But, you know, it's a, it's a five-year program that we're looking at. Yeah, but it's, it's cutting. As we've decided, at the end of the day. our own a new company called Frank Parametric Design, and we hope to be able to use this process, not just in Shuf, but in other valve companies or even um, other equipment companies as well. It sounds like you're quite excited about that venture. Mm, I think so. Well, it's, 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 a, it's always good to be technologically challenged, isn't it? We, we can't work just to earn money. Of course, that's why we work. But if we can add excitement and a bit of, 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 of joy to work, well, that's so much the better. It's always a bonus. And that, that leads me on nicely to kind of you as a person and sort of just, you know, for our listeners, a little bit about Frank outside of work, you know, the Frank family and, and Martin Frank, you know, what, what, do you get up, what, what do you get up to away from Shuff? Well, I want to live forever, so I've started doing more sports. I'd, have to up, I'd either have to give up drink or I have to live more healthily. So I decided to try and live more healthily and, and maintain drinking. So I go horse riding, I go jogging, I go hiking. Um, I, with friends of mine, every year we've uh, gone for a hike somewhere in the Alps or Pico de Europa or somewhere like that, or the, the, um, the Pyrenees or those kind of places. And... Um, I try to run a one or two half marathons a year and keep myself fit to do that. But my, my main hobby is horse riding. I used to do three-day eventing, but I don't compete anymore. I just don't. Um, it, that just takes up too much time. I prefer to do a little bit of jogging and a little bit of riding rather than just do only riding. So yeah. I do enough sports. And um, other than that, I like to read. You know, I read a lot of books. And um, but mo mostly fiction, not not work. You know, I don't want to. When I'm, once I'm at home, I want to expand, relax, and do things that I enjoy. Like that. Good stuff. Excellent. And, and I think, you know, from my point of view, and, and you know, the industry, I think the, the future is still pretty bright for Shuff. You know, we're, we're, we're still, um, you know, producing great valves and, and solving problems for customers. 
um, and, and long may that continue. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd just like to say thanks for joining us on the podcast today. It's Thank you very much, Steve. Pleasure to- Real pleasure to get you on on uh, for our listeners to uh, get an insight into Shuff and some of the early days and and what you guys have been up to. So, thank you very much, and uh, we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you very much uh, to you too, Steve. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Martin. Cheers. You've been listening to the Valve and Process Solutions Visionaries Podcast. Today's episode featured a conversation with Dr. Martin Frank of Shuff. And remember. Advice doesn't come in a box, it comes from Valve and Process Solutions. So if you want to challenge us to solve a problem, whether it's a single valve or an entire process, drop us a line, pick up at the phone or visit vandpsolutions.com. We deal with all inquiries and requests for advice on a case-by-case basis so you get the right solution for your application or project. If you've enjoyed this podcast, or if there's someone you think we should be interviewing, then let us know. Just drop us an email. Email kim at vandpsolutions.com.